technology of the 1920s, Modernism, Futurism, and Marxism in Struggle for Literature. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome everyone here. Uh, we have three speakers on today's panel. Our first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Oleg Ilnitsky. Uh, Oleg Ilnitsky uh, earned both his master's and doctorate at Harvard University. He is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies at the University of Alberta, where he taught undergraduate and graduate courses related to Ukrainian literature, culture, and language, as well as the department's graduate seminar on contemporary literary and cultural theory. He served as an associate chair for graduate studies and area coordinator for Slavic program. Uh, he was the editor of Canadian Slavonic Papers from 2001 to 2011 and of East West Journal of Ukrainian Studies from 2013 to 2016. His major areas of research include modernism and the avant-garde, Ukrainian Russian cultural relations and computer assisted text analysis. He is the author of more than 50 articles and of the book Ukrainian Futurism 1914-1930, an historical and critical study published in 1997, Ukrainian translation 2003. He's also a co-author with George Havrish of the four volume concordance to the poetic works of Taras Shevchenko and the online concordance to the complete works of Rihori Skovarada 2009 with Natalia Pulipiuk and Sergei Kozakov. At present, uh, uh, Wehrnitsky is completing a book on uh, Ukrainian Russian language writer Nikolai Gogol, Mikola Gogol. Pane Oleže, uh, Thank you very much, Vitaly. That was kind of you. Um, hello, everybody. It's uh, really great to be here. And uh, thank you, uh, Helena, and all the organizers of this uh, very fine conference. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for plugging my book. I think it's going to become a bestseller and I'm going to become rich. <laughs> uh, so, Slava uh, Ukraini. And uh, also congratulations to Germany for giving heavy arms to Ukraine. Uh, that's very good news. Um, <clears throat> well, when I published my book on Ukrainian futurism in 1997, I spoke about it as a formalist movement, obviously, uh, and noted mostly in passing that Russian formalism had some influence on uh, Ukrainian theories. Uh, today, um, building on this earlier work, I would like to uh, highlight the social aspects of this futurist formalism, uh, which I think distinguishes Ukrainian futurism from the early positions of the Russian formalists, notably uh, Shklovsky. Uh, in particular, I will speak about the interesting individual an, uh, an interesting individual, the Ukrainian futurist uh, Leonid Skripnik, uh, a theoretician with very strong formalist convictions who wanted to create a new social institution that would replace old art. First, um, a little background uh, to refresh our uh, memories. Uh, Ukrainian futurism was founded in 1914 that is five years after Italian futurism, which was established in 1909. Uh, Ukrainians viewed the Italians as uh, very important as a watershed in the history of art. Uh, they believed that after Italian futurism, art would never be the same. One of the earliest and most persistent themes of Ukrainian uh, futurism became the death of art. Uh, Mikhail Semenko, the founder of Ukrainian Futurism, uh, declared in 1914, quote, I wish Ukrainian art were dead. Uh, the death of art was understood as the destruction of previous artistic practices through formal experimentation. Ukrainian Futurism, like uh, other historical avant-garde, Cubism, Dada, German Expressionism, is obviously uh, and easily recognizable as a formalist phenomena, uh, given that uh, work, works it produced foregrounded devices and techniques uh, to the point what would say that the content or message of their work was often obscured. Uh, Ukrainian futurism spent most of its 15 years of existence rationalizing its formalist practices uh, before for Marxist and proletarian critics, but was finally destroyed in 1931 uh, precisely for the crime 
uh, formalism. So what was the nature of futurist formalism? Uh, well, obviously, of paramount importance was the rejection of realist conventions, uh, objectivity, uh, and mimesis. Uh, the most popular activity without doubt among futurists was the destruction of art. Uh, next to it was also synthesis, which implied fusing destroyed or atomized elements into a new systemic relation. Uh, Ukrainian futurists showed no respect for literature as an institution, namely as a coherent closed system of genres, uh, nor did they, were they prefer, prepared to sanctify genres uh, themselves. Uh, they refused to fetishize Is there a either fiction or fact, all the arts as subject to mutual crime. Can you hear me? Uh, we had an interruption for a few we seconds, a... but you're back. I'm back? Okay, yes. Uh, so I was, uh, as I was saying, Ukrainian futurism did not respect literature as an institution, and they refused to fetishize either fiction or, or, or fact. They viewed all forms of writing as, uh, as well as the arts as subject to mutual cross-fertilization. Uh, if form or genre can be considered a type of meaning that carries a certain amount of predictable information and promises a specific experience, uh, then the failure to practice writing with traditionally, within traditionally defined parameters automatically introduced ambiguities and disorientation, which for the futurist was a desirable effect. Uh, futurists happily re resorted to ad hoc and hybrid genres. For example, Simon Koch created Reft Foot Poema, a revolutionary futurist narrative poem. And they gave odd uh, subtitles to their uh, works like, uh, sometimes in French, for example, uh, Poème Philosophique, Poème Electrique, etc. And they mixed artistic discourses, as he says, practical, scientific, and journalistic styles with, uh, with fiction. Um, in short, uh, literature and art as systems uh, became fraught with chance and unpredictable formal outcomes. We know that in Russia, there was a very close symbiotic relationship between the avant-garde and formalism. Ehrlich, uh, Victor Ehrlich told, it, uh, told us that, quote, uh, the formalist movement had ever since its inception made common cause with the artistic avant-garde. In their early writing, early continued, Shklovsky and Jakobsen sought to elevate the futurist experiments into general laws of poetics, end of quote. Uh, he added also, Russian futurism may be held responsible for some of the egregious fallacies and shortcomings of Russian formalism. Ehrlich specifically criticized Russian formalism for its, quote, conception of the literary work as well as its approach to the problem of literary change, uh, saying that Shklovsky was guilty of aesthetic purism, uh, the tendency to tear art out of its social context. The formalists early continued, apparently mistook autonomy for separatism. They seem to deny any interaction between the various parts of the social fabric and to construe literary evolution as a wholly self-contained process, end of quote. So if um, these were the sins of Russian formalism and if they originated in Russian futurism, then <clears throat> Ukrainian futurism offers an interesting example of a formalist theory that from its inception uh, situated the literary work in society and viewed the literary institution as historically and socially contingent. The autonomy of art, we will recall, became a major issue during the second half of the 19th century and in the early 20th, defined the aestheticist and modernist movements in Ukraine and elsewhere, impacting Russian formalism as well. Uh, Marxist critics of various persuasion struggled against the art for art's sake uh, uh, orientation. The Ukrainian futures had their own approach to this problem. They tried to account theoretically 
for art's ineffectual status in society and argued that an alternate system of creativity was on the horizon. We know from Helena Babak and Alexander Dmitriev that formalism was alive and well in Ukraine during the 1920s, inspired both by native Ukrainian trends as well as by Russian influence. There's a, there is a strong affinity, for example, between Russian formalism and the work of the Ukrainian futurist, Oleksa Potoratsky. Uh, the titles of his work clearly show this. Potoratsky called one of his essays, Poetic Language and Practical Language. Uh, another had the name Through the Formal Method. A third, How to Make Novels. A fourth, bore the heading about the literature of fact. His book length study published in 1929 was titled Literary uh, Devices. The similarities to Russian formalism notwithstanding, Potoratsky approached Russian formalism both critically and analytically. Uh, the just mentioned book on literary devices, for example, was tellingly subtitled, quote, an attempt at a social analysis. Again, Helena Babak and Alexander Dmitriev have some interesting things to say about Potoratsky's work, which stands at the crossroads of formalism, Marxism, and Freudian uh, psychoanalysis. While Ukrainian futurists did produce a theory in the strict sense of the word, it was called pan-futurism, uh, much of it was expressed also in the form of manifestos. In fact, the scholarly discourse and the polemical are impossible to disengage in uh, Ukrainian futurist writings. The futurists, after all, were, I would say, agents of cultural and social, social change. Uh, both their art and theory were a cerebral and analytical practice that did not stand uh, aloof from society. They embodied a very contemporary uh, social a uh, very contemporary ideology uh, that extolled the machine, speed, and urban life. They set social goals for themselves. In Ukraine, for example, it was to transform a rural society and its ecology into a modern U European nation. Naturally, this distinguished Ukrainian futurists from Russian formalists who are not uh, only scholars, uh, but in their early ex extreme pronouncements, as already mentioned, they tended to isolate art from society theoretically as well as practically. Ukrainian futures, on the other hand, saw their own formalistic work as an essential step toward overcoming the alienation between artists and society. Their formal experimentation was the vehicle by which they revealed the device, the literariness of the work, but experimentation was equally, if not more importantly, an attack on art, especially on the notion of a self-sufficient artistic institution. This brings me, this brings me to Leonid Skripnik. Um, he died in Kharkiv in 1929 at the age of 36 from tuberculosis uh, and remains relatively unknown even today. In my view, uh, he deserves much more recognition. His literary legacy is small, but very original. Among other things, he translated a novel by Upton Sinclair, published on the subject of photography and cinema. Uh, between 1927 and 1928, he serialized a, a brilliant novel, in my opinion, titled The Intellectual, a six-part screened novel with a prologue and an epilogue. Uh, this latter work is ostensibly transcribed from a silent film as it is playing on the screen, while the author is also explaining and interpreting the events to the reader in disapproving and sarcastic uh, tones. In fact, in all his fiction, uh, Skripnik was a scathing satirist and anti-romantic, clearly expressing two major principles of Ukrainian futurism, formalism, and rationalism. In effect, he tried to embody the futurist slogan, art is dying as an emotional category. 
almost completely unstudied are Skripnik's six posthumous articles, uh, parts of an unrealized book he, that he called The Arts and Social Culture. Uh, they were serialized in 1929 in the futurist journal uh, Nova Generacia, The New Generation. Uh, this book, or rather these six essays, examine a broad range of arts, very loosely defined, and divided them into two opposing categories, the social and the asocial. The social arts included science, engineering, technology, the newspaper, architecture, documentary film, radio, and television. The asocial arts included theater, circus, opera, dance, music, sculpture, literature, including poetry and prose. Skripnik's major thesis is that the social arts must display, displace, must displace the asocial arts, which are based on and nourished by individualistic emotions. He argued that Individually refined emotions erect a barrier between the, the individual and society. These emotions isolate a person from the group. All arts make individuals superfluous and they rob society of their contribution. The social arts, on the other hand, are characterized by reason and intellect. Uh, Skripnik devotes much of his efforts to analyzing each art as a formal and structural category, uh, trying to identify, especially in the asocial arts, those elements that might be socially redeemable, at least in the interim before a new rational system comes into being. He is uh, guided by the axiom the less art, in a work of art, the less harmful it is. Elsewhere, he says, if the word is to play a rational, useful role, then metaphors and metonymies must be expelled from language. For him, opera becomes one example of many uh, of the useless uh, asocial arts. Skripnik writes about opera sarcastically. He says, we must stage as quickly as possible operas on themes like, quote, the industrialization of the country, highways, agricultural cooperation, and the rational maneuvering of land. When we at last hear the aria of the first lovers singing on the subject of the comparative value of horse manure and superphosphate, when we admire for the last time the dance or the airy ballet of locksmiths, we will then be able to shut down the opera. On the other hand, we can do that even sooner, he adds. According to Skripnik, art represents a dynamic social institution uh, that has been changing throughout history. And therefore, there's no guarantee that it will exist in the same way in the future. Uh, the avant-garde, he said, proved that art had entered a state of permanent bankruptcy. Uh, since it was being demolished from within by formalist experiments. He, he says, quote, almost throughout its entire existence, art exclusively served the church and the higher aristocracy. He goes on to mention 18th century French painter Jean-Antoine Watteau and Jean-Honoré uh, Fragonard, saying that they served, quote, the last kings of pre-revolutionary France. He then notes that with the transfer of power to the bourgeoisie, a new era of art begins. And then adds, over the last 200 years, art was transformed from a sacred art into a special extra-social or perhaps super social category. In Ukraine, it was poza socialna, che može nad socialna categoria. But because the social ground has changed again with the socialist revolution, 
uh, old art is bankrupting even further because during the proletarian dictatorship, science, technology, and engineering will flourish, not art. Despite current attempts by Marxists to give the old arts a cultural role in educating the masses, this, in Skripnik's opinion, is hopeless. Why? Because the old arts continue to use lose their peculiar aura and are doomed. Only avant-gardists, thanks to their social instinct, can see the signs of decay in the in the arts and are contributing to its their dec decomposition by experimentation, thereby accelerating its death. He adds, quote, art cannot, by virtue of its essence, play a cultural and social role. He disagrees with those defenders of art who believe that art is valuable as a medium for uh, conveying useful content. Skripnik maintains that even uh, art that has socially ultra useful content is completely unreliable. To summarize then, running through Skripnik's theoretical work is uh, a recognition that institutions, among them uh, art, are socially constructed and that they cannot be viewed in isolation. Uh, he thinks his thinking is governed by a strong sense of historicity. Historical periods, in his view, are always subject to dominant principles. In the current instance, rationalism and science, which are organizing the new culture. This is why the ivory tower artist, the one who still believes in the idea of beauty and form, was about to be transformed into something more akin to craftsmanship. Like a Russian formalist, Ukrainian futurists clearly wanted to know and define what art or literature was. But Ukrainians thought of art in terms of social structures or institutions much earlier than Russian formalists. Uh, the imminent concrete forms of art were important, but they needed to be seen as part of a larger structure or larger structures. In Skripnik's case, the large set that he analyzed were the asocial and social arts. The rules or the structuring principle that uh, governed these, uh, uh, these arts were respectively emotions and reason. The two explain why the former would die and the latter would live. The organizers of this conference stated in the introduction to our program, quote, the formal method along with the Marxist method uh, were the two main competing approaches to literary analysis in the 1920s. I would suggest that the futurists were a third and a competing method that had its own nu nuances and its own emphases. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ilnitsky, uh, for these insightful uh, and thought-provoking uh, remarks, indeed complicating our cognitive map of the Ukrainian intellectual field of the 1920s is something we certainly need to do as we are discovering all of its richness and diversity and texture. And it's great that we are having such a discussion at this conference and at this panel in particular. I would like to propose that we have a general discussion after all three speakers present their papers. So colleagues, if you have questions or comments for Professor Ilnitsky, please hold them uh, for the general discussion. For now, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Olena Haleta. Uh, she is a professor of literary theory and comparative literature at the Ivan Franko National University in Lviv and Professor of Cultural Anthropology at the Ukrainian Catholic University. She's researched and taught modern and contemporary Ukrainian literature, 
at universities and academic institutions in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Europe. She is currently a visiting professor at the University of Warsaw in Poland. Professor Haleta is an author, co-author, and co-editor of eight books on uh, the literary history of modern Ukraine, including uh, very recently Seeing Ukraine, Independent Literature of 1991-2021, which is a special issue of the academic journal Knizhevna Smotra, her recent monograph in uh, Ukrainian from anthology to ontology is dedicated to the history of representation of Ukrainian literature of the late 19th, early 21st century. Thank you very much, Vitaly, for introducing me to the audience. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. And now I would ask for sharing my screen, my presentation. Yes, because I do not have permission. Who can do it once again? I'm trying to do, but um, I got notification that host disabled participants screen sharing. So please give me this permission, and then I will try not only to say something, but also to show something, to demonstrate fragments of text. I'm going to analyze. Um, I'm sorry, Bajena, are you here? Because I think Bajena has to uh, to give this permission. Maria, Maria will give the permission. Ah, okay, not thanks a lot. Uh -huh. Okay, once again, I'm still trying, but uh, still do not have this function. <laughs> okay, maybe I will we'll start and in a moment I will try once again. So as it was said, the general title of my presentation is Ukrainian Literary Criticism of the 1920s, Yuri Majenko Diary as Self-Articulation. And for the very beginning, I would like to say several words about Majenko. Uh, he was one of the prominent Ukrainian literary criticists of the 1920s. Why I um, uh, um, I only uh, say about this this one decades because decade, decade because Majenko was trained um, as bibliographer and um, he also was interested in Ukrainian literary process. Uh, of the second decade of the 20th century, the third decade of the 20th century. But after ideological pressure, he moved to Leningrad in the uh, middle 30s. And after that, he stopped to publish something dedicated to literary process. But Majanko was born in Ukraine in Russian speaking family in Kharkiv and moved with his family as a baby uh, to Chernihiv. Uh, he graduated from classical gymnasium and after then from Moscow University and he started successfully started his career in Moscow. But after 1917, he decided to return to Ukraine. And as we know from uh, his uh, biography, the first document, official document, yes, Ukrainian document, uh, he um, was issued for Majanko in 1918. He was a founder of Ukrainian National Library and also Ukrainian Book Chamber. And now, once again, I'm, oh, okay. I hope it will work. Just a moment, uh, tak. Sure, and what exactly? I hope that it will help. Um, moment. Not sure how to do it. It's a bit looks a bit complicated, but I'm still trying to do it. Uh, okay, just a moment. Share a screen. Uh -huh, okay. Mm -hmm. I just see different, sorry. Um, sorry, maybe. Well, wait, no worries. Just share yeah, screen. I'm, I'm trying to uh, choose your precise um, uh, screen which you want to share. Yeah, it should show your a window, and you have to put. Yeah, um, uh, I see something a bit different. Just this top arm, um, maybe here. Um, yes. 
We'll try. No, no. Just green uh, button down and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do exactly. Uh, yes, exactly. But maybe in this way. Yeah. Oh, I hope sure. it works. So I'm so sorry. Oh, now you can see also my presentation. That's Majanko Ex Libris. And now, um, okay. Oh, yes, maybe this way. Yeah. Um, now you can see a description of Majanko Diary. And this one diary hasn't been published yet. Uh, you can uh, see the first, uh, the date of the first record, 19, so June 19, 1919, and the last record is dated by um, December 28, 1926. Um, this diary is a part of Marzhenko archive, and what is important to remember that Marzhenko himself was professional bibliographer and he structured his own archive and prepared this archive for further reading, I would say. But uh, yeah, and now several words about my methodological approach. I considered archive to be not only a collection of documents about our cultural past, but also a resource for understanding our presence and also for constructing, for imaging our cultural future. So I refer to Dilte differentiation between historical and literary archives, uh, who said that literary archives documents um, the very process of writing. And um, I'm also fascinated by Michel Foucault's idea that um, archive is a general system of formation and transformation of expression. Uh, archive is considered to be a voice in a place of memory, what means that archives is a place of writing as a basis of trust or legitimation of power, according to Michel de Certeau. Archive is also understood by Alaida Asman as recording as, uh, as a discharge of personal memory and a mechanism Mechanism, cultural mechanism of creating a hierarchy of cultural values. And at the same time, I consider uh, archive to be a kind of cultural performance. But it's Groys said that archive is a starting point for the new. So we could also generate some new cultural meanings, reading and rereading cultural and literary archives. Arjun Apadurai also defined archive as a space for designing of experimental identities, and Sven Speaker defined archive as a project of the future and a form of critical invasion into the present. And in, his, uh, in their preface to collective monograph, uh, Knut Abeling and Stefan Gunzel said that archive is a kind of cultural opportunity. And just to conclude this one series, theoretical part, I would like to citate Michel Foucault, who said that archive is uh, first the law of what can be said, the system that governs the appearance of statesmen as unique events. And I would like to citate also Giorgio Agamben and his idea about archive, that archive is the set of rules that define the events of discourse. And now I would like to be back to Majenko diary. Uh, as we know from his correspondence with Vasil Pivdoradny and also Fedir Maksimenko from the second half of the 30s, uh, he said twice at least yes, that his archive was completely destroyed. I'm not sure that Majenko uh, said a true, yes, because maybe he just decided that that is a not a proper time to publish or to use at least some information from his diary written in 20s. But nevertheless, answering a numerous question um, addressed by Vasil Pietoradny to him about literary process of 20s, he said that archive uh, was destroyed, it was burned in Kharkiv in 30s, and also it, um, uh, the whole archive and also his diary. But now we can find this one notebook, yes, which, uh, which contains several uh, notes, several, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, about 100 pages of um, uh, notes dated from 1919 to 1926. Um, this remarks looks 
to be a bit sporadical, but at least the very beginning and the very end of this one diary are really remarkable. First of all, Majenko starts with a question, what is a reason to write a diary in 1919? And his answer is that he understood the very meaning and an influence of his uh, contemporaries. Uh, he understand that the whole circle of his friends consists of people who will later be remembered in Ukrainian culture. So that is why Majenko starts with notification about different literary meetings, discussions, and so on. I would like to demonstrate this one page, the title page of this diary, because pay attention here that the number of year is written by uh, uh, pencil, yes, and the whole text is written by pen. That means that, uh, that Majenko uh, Mm, try to organize or a bit better organize his diary in several years, uh, several years later than he started to, um, to do these remarks. But this one page was written several years later, no doubt, because he cited, you, um, he cited Gregory Kosinka, uh, his short novel, which, which was published for the first time in 1923. That is a year of, uh, of discussion about Ukrainian formalism, discussion in Czerwony Szlach, and we could realize that Mashenko is a bit ironical also here in this text. He described himself as Ukrainian intelligent, who is a bit disorientated in a situation, and he said that that is the full truth about Ukrainian intelligent. You could see some other pages. Also, uh, there are notes in different colors uh, written by pen, by pencil. And here, Majenko tried to collect uh, information about Ukrainian writers, about pseudonyms of Ukrainian writers, too. The whole text is dedicated to Ukrainian literary process. First of all, Majenko reflect a process of organizing and developing Muzahed. Muzahed not only as journal, but first of all as a circle, as a community. Uh, he's interested in organizing Ukrainian literary life. And the first uh, question he reflected is a question about differentiation. How to define who belong to Ukrainian culture? For Majenko, the main differentiation is differentiation between old and new writers, not old and young. I dedicated to this one question in another one, my article, but between old and new. New writers are those who started to write and publish after 1917, because as for him, new reality really need a new kind of writing, new kind of language to be articulated. Uh, Majenko also described his own relation between a personal, uh, with different personalities. And that is interesting to compare um, his publication and also his uh, private characteristic. We know that Majenko defined Tichina as one of the most important Ukrainian writer of this period. At the same time, they conflicted very often, and it looks like Bas Majenko and Tuchina were really ambitious. They discuss methodological question, but not only. This one remark described Muzahat meetings, which happened in the end of June 1919. And uh, Majenko uh, wrote that he was criticized, sharply criticized by Tuchina, especially because the psychological approach to Tuchina's creativity, Tuchina's poetry. But now we can to compare this one text with Pavlo Tuchina diary. We know that only some fragments uh, are are preserved and Tichina described this one meetings or refer rather to these meetings um, uh, al almost two years later. He also said that he was one of the first who uh, destroyed Muzahed uh, circle. At the same time, Tichina is number one for Majenko is because of his 
poetry. Another one, ah, oh, yeah, uh, we could also see that relation, this complicated relation with the with, with China. Uh, so this one, it's not a conflict, yes, but it's very sharp discussion, uh, which occurred not only once, but several years later, uh, Majanko with the China and also with Filipovich and Zerov tried to organize another one uh, journal under the title Mestetska Tribuna, and Majanko characterized the China once again as a person who is uh, not able to uh, co-work with other people. So that is their subjective impression, but nevertheless, it's interesting to compare, compare a literary critical approach and also some private characteristic. Another one, ah, but I have to say that Majanko is quite self-critical. And a bit later, so that's once again in 1919, he also uh, wrote that uh, uh, he's, um, he's also limited in his literary criticism, limited by language and limited by method. Why? Because method? Because he's not educated, uh, educated as a specialist in literary studies. And why he's uh, also uh, limited by language? Because, as I said, he uh, grew up and he also was educated in Russian language. But in 1918, he decided not only to move to Ukraine, from Moscow, but also to change his family name, so to change his surname. Yes, it's not family name, but in some way it's also connected with the history of his family, because he was born as uh, um, Georgi Ivanov. So in his Russian documents, his Georgi Ivanov, but when he crossed Russian-Ukrainian borders, border, he decided that now he will be Yuri Majenko. Maja is a border, yes, that is also an act of border crossing. At the same time, he decided to move from Russian language to Ukrainian language. And in 1919, he understood that his Ukrainian language is really very poor and he is not a good in literary criticism also because of this limitation. Another one story, a personal story, which is also very interested and reflected in this diary, is the relation between Majenko and Mikhail Semenko. We know from Klin Polishchuk publication, Zviru Revoluci, uh, and this text, text was published for the first time in 1923, that Semenko uh, did not participate in Muzahat meeting. But we could learn something completely different from Majanko diary, because Majanko wrote that um, Semenko participate and was highly interested in discussion. Majanko also thought that uh, Semenko only is looking for authors for mestetstvo, but in June 1919, he also wrote that Semenko is very interesting psychological type, and he is not an apologist. He do, does not apologize proletarian art as it seemed to be. That is interesting remark, and nevertheless, Majenko polemized with Ukrainian futurist. So developing his own formalistic approach, he was rather clothed to zero, to neoclassical approach. Uh, yes. Here we could see uh, some characteristics he gave to he gave to zero, and zero is for him very interesting. Very interesting as a type of literary criticist who's also educated intellectualist. But at the same time, Majanko tried to differentiate his own position and zero position. Uh, yeah. Majanko also paid attention to se several cases when people, uh, writers or literary critics, decide to move from Russian language to Ukrainian language. As for him, Ukrainian language is one of an attribute of the new Ukrainian culture. Uh, I will be back to this one question because it uh, appeared just sporadically in the first part of this diary, I mean about nine, between years 1919-1923. 
uh, he reflects uh, to uh, he tried to characterize literary works and literary style by different Ukrainian writers, but that is not my task today to give you all of this citation. I would like to move to Mazhenko publication Na Shlechach do Novoy Teori on the roads to new theory, which appeared in 1923. And this one publication was a kind of declaration of formalistic method in Ukrainian literature criticism. Criticism. I would like to pay attention that Mezhenko rather defined this matter method formal than formalistic. So to avoid association with formalism, maybe Russian formalism, or maybe also with formalism in um, Soviet understanding. Yes, formalism and nationalism and other others um, negative. Yes, correct, uh, negative characteristic uh, given to Ukrainian writers. And we see that Mezhenko started to uh, work on this topic, not because he was just interested in this topic, but he was also invited by editorial works to, uh, um, to share his knowledge, to share his ideas about new methodology in literary criticism, in literary studies after revolution. Uh, Mazhenko was interested in the general question, in what way the new art, the new liturgy could be differentiated from the old one. And the main task, the main question, the most complicated question for him was the question about relation between form and content. Uh, in his article, he cited Zhermunsky about dichotomy, his thought about dichotomy of form and context, content, but Mezhenko is rather uh, so Mezhenko is rather thinking about um, um, form, uh, the only one, uh, the only one element of literary work which could be really analyzed. And he characterized content, uh, content as something subjective. We are talking here about individual and also about collective subjectivity when different group of readers can treat, interpret in different way the same works. So I try to understand how many time do I have, but still. So, okay, several more words about this one publication. So Mezhenko reflects for several times his work on this topic about form and context. And he wrote that he's not ready to give the final answer to this question. He understood that he failed with this, uh, with this uh, publication, that he failed with looking for this final uh, the final for this final answer. At the same time, he is deeply interested in this one topic. Uh, he tried to understand what kind of influence of uh, the general author's worldview we could analyze in literary work. Um, and finally, he decided that the pure formal method is. Um, a kind of literary crime. But at the same time, he said that subjectivism, as in case of zero, is also not acceptable. When I read this one diary, I pay my attention to the date because this one remark is dated by uh, April 22, 1923. And uh, uh, this article was published in number two of Czerwony Szlach. And Czerwony Szlach was a journal published monthly. But I think that the editorial board was a bit late with this publication, uh, also because in number eight was published Volodymyr Koryak article with some um, remarks on Mezhenko publication. And Mezhenko read it and answered it to Koryak only at the beginning, uh, only in January 1924. So I I think that he wrote this remark before finishing and before publishing his article. Uh, 
um, what else? Uh, yeah, that is almost the same, but this one publication was a kind of conflict with an editorial board of Czerwony Schlach. As we know, this publication was um, appeared with a small remark from editorial board when uh, where was said that, um, that editorial was, uh, uh, board does not share Mezhenko ideas. Uh, what we could find in his diary is an idea that about a new uh, a new uh, liter a new book, uh, which uh, in, and in this book Mazenko planned to collect his um, publication, his critical publication dedicated to Sosura Khvalovi, Chumak Mikhailichenko, and Kobolansky. But finally, he hesitated, and it happened. Uh, it happened. After uh, Volodymyr Koryak um, um, publication appeared, um, this one I just uh, I, I just mentioned um, the, the publication in Czerwony Szlach. Uh, before of that, another one publication appeared, and an author was um, of this publication was V. Gadzinski, who recommend Majenko not to share ideas like um, ideas about uh, a role of form in literary works, and he said that he recommend it just friendly as communist. And uh, how Majenko reacted to Volodymyr Koryak publication, it's also interesting. He wrote two different letters and text of these letters are included to his diary. The first one was addressed to editorial board and now you can see the full, just in a moment, you can see the full text of this letter. What he said in this letter that uh, um, Koryak publication is not acceptable, and he regrets that editorial board just published this text without any remarks. Why? Because correct, uh, Koryak is not correct with biographical facts and this citation. Nothing about methodology, just about facts. And also Mazhenko asked an editorial board not to uh, publish this one letter. And he also wrote that he is working on another one letter to Koryak, and this one will be private one. In his letter to Koryak, he, um, uh, he tried to describe in what moment, in what fragment of, of his publication, he... Um, he saw falsification of facts, biographical facts, first of all, incorrect, uh, incorrect citation, and Majanko refers to his own biography, mentions his own participation in the Underground Revolutionary Committee, and so on, so on. And finally, he rejects accusation of changing the front. He tried to describe this change is not ideological one, but as a stylistic one, as a change, as a moving his his, his movement from symbolistical approach to, as he said, materialistic or uh, materialistic philosophy. Uh, after this one publication, after this one letter, Majenko decided not to continue this one discussion, not to participate in this one discussion. And we see that if at the beginning of the 20s, Majenko start this question about the very nature about literary creativity, different methodological approach, then in two or three uh, year, the very subject of this discuss, discussion was changed because the main topic of this discussion was personal biography and ideological, uh, ideological issue. Uh, what I would like to add, I think that I'm over with time, yes? Is it true? Yeah, okay. Uh, if I can to add several more uh, things, um, I think that that's very interesting to see how the very character of Mashenko writing is changing after 1923. If uh, in the first half of this diary, he paid attention to literary events, to literary discussion, to different literary works. In the second half, he paid attention to his private life. He met Olha Gan and he fell in love with uh, Olga and he started to describe this private story. So we have really 
like many pages remark and he described different emotions, phys physiological condition and so on, so on. But at the same time, another one que question is raising in this part of text. And that is a question about cultural belonging. Olha was also from Chernihiv, but at that time he uh, lived in Moscow. And Majanko uh, started to discuss very important issue for himself. What does it mean? Uh, does it mean to be Ukrainian for him? He was not very happy about this issue. Oh, I can citate also one of uh, poetry piece uh, written by Majanko. He never pub he had never published his poetry, but he, he from time to time he tried to write something like that. Možlivo što celiš počatok, a možda zledeni kinec, mabuć što to vje kinec, a možda zledeni počatok. Just several lines from uh, a whole piece of this poetical piece. But yes, I'm going back. So Majanko uh, uh, understood that for him, it's not possible to build some clo close relation with a person who do not share his overview and with a person with another cultural um, belonging. So for him, it's very important. And what I also realized from his diary that in nine, uh, 1923, in 1924, he wrote this letter to Olhagan in Ukrainian language. And only after that, he translated uh, these letters to Russian language. I was really surprised because once again, in 1919, he wrote that he is limited by language. But five years later, he uh, uh, wrote to Olha Gan that uh, some important things could be reflected only in your native language. And for him, this native language is Ukrainian, but not Russian. Uh, Majanko, yes, I just would like to the end of my presentation. So as I said, the last remark is dated by 1926, and that is the only one remark. In 1924, he reflects the general political situation. This is not a fight by dirty abuse without the right to defend yourself. And the last one remark is, is um, dedicated to his diary written uh, before 1917. This one document I didn't find in his archive, but Majenko wrote that he found a lot of interesting things were reading his diary, this uh, previous part of his diary, especially the entry for uh, February 6. Hell, if I know what I believe. Maybe Ukrainianism will save me. Was that right? Were this the first steps I took to national consciousness? In what strange form did my cultural belonging evade? Now it's kind of weird to read my notes over the years. Someone else wrote them. And the last sentences from this diary. Now leaves Majanko, but Ivano once wrote it. It's not by chance that I forgot my name and that I forgot my young, year, young years. Everything is new. I seem to purify myself. Sorry, I do not see because I see myself on the screen, but not the text. So I seem to purify myself in the revolution. So for Majenko, this one... Um, Period, period from 1917 to 1919, to the beginning of the 20s, was a period of revolution. And he was looking for a new kind of literature, new kind of uh, um, methodological approach to analyze this new kind of writings. And if he started with rethinking literary methodology, then finally he rethink himself, his name, his role, and his cultural belonging. Just to conclude my presentation, I would like to say that in case of liturgies, which could be defined as um, liturgies of dominated groups of so-called secondary nations, it's especially important to read and analyze not only 
um, novels or poetry which belong to classical literary hierarchy of genres, but also different marginal texts, because many ideas and many experiences articulated in such kind of texts are not articulated in published works because of many different reasons. Thank you for, the, for your attention, and I would be glad to answer your, your question a bit later. Thank you so much, Elena, uh, for this rich and uh, insightful presentation with which combined both many uh, theoretical uh, foundations, but also fascinating information from uh, this um, great archival source. Uh, and I fully agree with your final remark that uh, these kind of texts are um, highly important to become more, more prominently uh, featured in the discussion of literatures uh, that were in a subaltern status uh, within cultural history. Our third speaker today is Olesya Omilchuk. Unfortunately, she did not send me her biographic note, uh, but uh, from the website of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, I can tell you that she has a degree of candidate of sciences in philology with specialization in literary theory. She got her candidate of sciences degree in 2003. She's a senior researcher in the Department of Theory of Literature at the Institute of Literature of National Academy of Sciences. Uh, you have the floor now. Yes. Uh... Right, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Everyone, okay. Uh, my topic sounds uh, some aspects of Volodymyr Koryak Marxist criticism. Uh, Volodymyr Koryak has the image of the most orthodox Ukrainian Soviet critic. Indeed, he lived up to this image. However, a deeper analysis of his biography and his works can provide a more nuanced understanding of his heritage. Koryak was a Marxist of the pre-revolutionary generation. His opinions were influenced by the debate between the newspaper Rada and the magazine Is Ukrainska Hata between Dmrodonsov and the magazine Dwin. In 1913, Koryak published the collection of his articles titled To the Gate, the Brahman, where he presented himself as a Marxist and tried to explain the correlation between national nationality and Marxism. From 1917 to 1920, Koryak was a member of the Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party. Members of this party were called Borodbe, translated uh, as uh, those who struggle. This aspect of his li life lets us understand how Borodbe or Borodbeism were interpreted in his articles, as well as in the Ukrainian Soviet literature. Korea criticized them, uh, criticized Borodbe for nationalism and utopianism, but that didn't stop him from studying their heritage. For example, Koryak edited the book by Yuri Lavinenko about a borrowed with Vasil Blakitny, published in 1929. At the beginning of the 1930s, Koryak began working on publication about another borrowed with Vasil Chumak and met his family. Later on, the brother of Vasil Chuma, Mikola, became central to the criminal case against Korea in 1937. As a critic, Korea was formed in the pre-Soviet context that influenced his later Soviet activity and proletarian narratives. Korea's biography covers both 
the period of the genesis of proletarian literature and the period of the transition to socialist realism. Since 1919, proletarian concept became the main cultural concept in Ukraine. Correct published article focusing on the problem of proletarian criticism and proletarian art. He rejected academism, but wrote about the need for truly scientific Marxist criticism. Since, since uh, 1922, as Helena Babak and Alexander Dmitriev have shown, Korak has been trying not only to criticize formalism, but also to reconcile formalism with Marxism. However, these attempts were rather awkward. Korak didn't offer any authentic intellectual insight to the formalist work, but produced politicized ideas. From 1919 to 1924, Korak published a lot on various topics that were later included in his collection, Organization of October Literature. But Korak's most ambitious project was his work on the history of the Ukrainian literature. He wrote three books focused on this topic. Essay on the history of Ukrainian literature, pre bourgeois period. Essay on the history of Ukrainian literature, bourgeois period, and Ukrainian literature synopsis. According to the correct plan, this was going to be a Marxist history of literature. But Korak realized that such project was methodologically impossible. Therefore, he adopted chronology as his main conceptual framework. By chronological framework, I mean the division into social economic phases. He didn't reject the aesthetic, uh, aesthetic factor uh, of the literature, but explained it through the Marxist categories of base and superstructure. Correct literary discourse on literature was marked by such Marxist features as anti-bourgeois rhetoric, emphasis on non-textual factors of creativity, attention to the political and social themes of literary work, and evaluation of the writer's biography from a class point of view. At the same time, Korak's work contains a large number of important nuances. This turns his literary practices into a space for methodological search and a space for a temporary ideological and aesthetic compromise. What are the nuances and what are the compromises? The first nuance concerns ideas about the essence of proletarian literature, its origin and prospects. In this sense, in Korak's discourse, we find coexistence, coexistence of the three schemes of construction of the proletarian literature. The first one is the proletarian literature as Terra Nova. The second one is the scheme, is the theme of proletarian literature as a continuation of the pre-revolutionary positivist and socialist ideas. Finally, proletarian literature as a transformation of the past so-called bourgeois qualities and their recombination with new proletarian one. The second nuance is the reception of bourgeois literary tradition, in particular modernist current and narodism. The presence of their stylistic features in the Ukrainian literature of the Soviet era prompted Korak to use the concept of intermediate ideological forms. As for Narodnetsvo, it acquires the status of ne negative recognition. It's presented as an influential, albeit negative phenomenon of Ukrainian literature. The third aspect of Korak's critique is its specific anti-colonialism. 
which was closely related to the problem of the national components of literature. On the one hand, Koryak gave many examples of how Ukrainian culture was oppressed by Russian imperial policy. But on the other hand, due to the Marxist anti-colonial strategy, Ukrainian national literature was marginalized. It was described as something underdeveloped and got contrasted with proletarian prosperity. In this context, we can raise the question of anti-colonial Marxist cultural strategy as a political tool that is a new form or new way of colonization. The last specific aspect is the problem of style. First of all, the problem of realism and realism. Instead of the cautious attitude to realism as a bourgeois phenomenon, Koryak turned to the adoption of realism and later to an attempt to invent something new, domestic realism, proletarian constructive realism, neorealism. As a result, Koryak began to support proletarian realism. It's proletarian realism that becomes the prototype of socialist realism. Also, from the first half of the 1930s, they were also treated as antagonistic phenomena. In one of his articles, Volodymyr Koryak rejoiced that in 1918, Russian artillery destroyed the house of Mikhail Grushevsky in Kiev, where part of the historian's private library perished. But ironically, Koryak's private library was lost as a result of the Soviet arrest. It numbered several thousand volumes. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to uh, Dr. Omilchuk. Uh, and uh, we actually have quite uh, a lot of time uh, now for questions and uh, comments uh, from the audience. And uh, my first uh, question as, or rather suggestion or invitation would be uh, to our panelists if they have comments on each other's work because we have this wonderful a triangulation set up between the different aspects of Ukrainian literary critical uh, intellectual life and uh, that are seen both in institutional uh, for terms but also in ideological terms so this helps us you know build a much more sort of vibrant sort of textured uh, three-dimensional picture. So colleagues, any thoughts, reflections, or comments from you? Olena, please. If I can, thank you so much. So I have a question to Olesia because Olesia works with Volodymyr Koryak publication and maybe some unpublished material. And my question is about this letter from Majenko to Koryak. Because a story with two letters I mentioned is quite interesting. After he wrote this letter to uh, editorial board of Chervoni Shlach, he also wrote a small remark in the end that this letter was not sent. But in the same day, he wrote the second letter to Koryak, and after that, he wrote that both of this letter were sent by recommended, uh, like, post. So my question is, if this one letter of Majenko is known by researchers who work with Koryak materials, and another one, my question is about Koryak publication in Chervoni Shlach, which appeared in 1922 under the title uh, Form and Content. And as for me, it looks really interesting because it's seven page long and only one and a half pages are dedicated to really critical overview of formalistic ideas. After that, what we have in this publication is 
a general overview of ideas articulated by Zhermunsky and Shklovsky. And I was even a bit surprised because also ideas articulated by uh, Wittlin and uh, Hvistek, if I don't miss. So for me, it's a very good source to understand what is published and in what way different kind of formalistic approach are developed at that time. So my question to Olesa is also how um, she characterized how she took this publication by Koryak, how deeply he was interested in this approaches and how it is connected with his Marxist um, position in this early publication of 20s, yes. Uh, it's very simple on the one hand, but at the same time, it, um, it can be a very long answer. Mm. Answering shortly, um, I must say that uh, Koryak uh, was typical Marxist, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, um, besides, uh, he hasn't uh, good education because uh, some political circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, um, of course, he was a great fan of literary, literary uh, criticism, literary process. But um, his problem with um, um, academism, with uh, serious knowledge, um, very uh, we can feel very well. Uh, and uh, his uh, describing of formalism or formalist ideas um, always uh, has uh, two parts. First, uh, firstly, it, it described and very good described um, uh, formal uh, ideas of formalism, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, um, he has problem with own um, interpretation of uh, from Marx's point of point of view. Mm -hmm. So Think I think uh, he was typical Marxist critic. Yeah. He wasn't. Uh, he can't. Uh, he wasn't adopt uh, formalism as uh, equal method. As mm -hmm. equal method to study literature. Um, mm -hmm. So I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think that this question about Marxism, formalism, and so on as characteristic, it's really complicated in case of Ukrainian literary criticism of 20s, because sometimes they are connected in a very specific way. In case of Majanka, I also found one, some, some very interesting remark when he defined himself as Soviet, but Ukrainian literary criticist. Especially interesting is for me, looks this one, dated by 1925. I see the future of Ukraine as bright and wonderful. I was fortunate to see the rebirth of my people, and this is a double revival, national and social. The second provides the first, a socially liberated nation cannot per perish. It will create extraordinary cultural values. And what is especially remarkable for me, that Mezhenko is describing a great Ukrainian future, but he is doing it in the past, in the past tense. So that's, as for me, it's very interesting text because he described this future, but he uh, doesn't see himself as a part of this great future, as for me. Thank you, Olesa, also for your presentation and responding to my question. Thank you so much, Olena. Uh, and yes, that is a fascinating reflection, sort of uh, re the use of tense and the yeah. subtle <laughs> hints of what it can tell us about how things are situated. I see we now have several uh, uh, hands raised and I will call on colleagues in the order uh, they have appeared. So first to Ola Hilnitsky, please, another fellow panelist. Thank you, Olesha, for your paper. Um, uh, as you know, uh, Koryak was not a big fan of uh, the futurists. Um, I'm just wondering, um, uh, and this is also for Olesha. Um, 
I'm just wondering, is there anything, um, he was, uh, was he was a party member, right? He was a member of the uh, uh, party. And I'm wondering whether there's any um, sort of material about uh, what kind of um, discussions were taking, being take, took place uh, within party circles about the futurist or, for, or formalist orientation. Is there any, um, are there any letters, are there any documents that show that the party uh, tried to direct the discussion in a particular way? Do, uh, do you mean uh, paper discussion uh, by uh, writing by Korea? I'm sorry, I didn't catch what you said. Uh, uh, do you mean uh, paper discussion about formally writing by Korea? Yes, well, as a party member, are there any um, internal documents, let's say, from the, from the from discussions uh, inside the party, how the party might have wanted to influence the direction of the these literary debates? Uh, communist party, yes. Uh, so, uh, Communist Party of Ukraine. Right. Uh, of course, I asked because um, I uh, I was talking about uh, Borodovic Party, but uh, we know that uh, after um, 1820, uh, Koryak uh, was a participant of uh, Ukrainian Communist Party. Um, he he was forced to enter. Uh, of course, uh, party. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, direction of communist party was um, a very influential part of of the Ukrainian literary literary movement. Movement, but um, early Soviet literature has um, specific comparing this period with uh, later Soviet movement after about uh, 1930s. So this direction uh, were not uh, so, um, so pressure maybe or so strong. Um, Uh, I think uh, that uh, many critics and many writers uh, wrote uh, mm, uh, they uh, they were engaged uh, more in pre-revolutionary or early revolutionary time mm -hmm. than in something uh, Marxist, something totalitarian, etc. Thank you. All right, uh, Helena. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I just want to join uh, join the discussion. First of all, thanks uh, all of you to your wonderful presentations. And I think that um, it could be quite helpful, helpful to answer both um, Olena's and uh, Oleg's questions by mentioning a very important but unknown article of Vladimir Karyak from 1922, published in the newspaper Visti Vutsevaka, mm -hmm. uh, which is name is uh, titled as uh, Na literaturnomu fronte formalistichna navala. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is, uh, why, why this uh, precise um, um, article note is important uh, in, in two senses. First of all, where it uh, was published, yeah, it, it was Visti. Uh, third is that it was published before a kind of official critique of uh, formalism started by Leon Trotsky, 1923. It means that official critique of formalism in Ukraine started a little bit earlier. And the next is uh, 
what is Karek doing there? He tries to um, mark all the uh, possible approaches to the study of literature, like Potemnian, um, uh, uh, so-called formalists. I don't remember the precise names, of, uh, the, the way he names them precise, but he changed a little bit, like uh, ex uh, experimental no formalistic critica, something like this. Yeah, um, but I think it's uh, quite a very um, uh, important fact in all these uh, discussions of uh, uh, early uh, formalist Marxist approaches. And uh, my question actually, yeah, and another important text about Karak's attitude to futurism is uh, his um, from 1918 is Tararam and uh, uh, as I remember from that same year, yeah, uh, where he uh, criticized uh, Muzaget uh, uh, and uh, Ukrainska Hata, and he says that the future of the literature belongs to futurists. Uh, so it's very important to understand, even, even, um, even um, taking into account that he was against like this moment and uh, afterwards he criticized it, but still he understood that like, um, that is in his point of view, the only movement that um, yeah? like <laughs> uh, describes uh, the time, the, the precise time uh, they lived in. And uh, my question is um, both to Alessa and to Alec. Um, uh, like the, the first one to Alessa is, um, you said that uh, he, uh, Karak is a very good example of a real uh, Marxist critique. But um, I think we don't know what is uh, Marxist critique in its early stage. Uh, actually, it's a, a big, I think, um, a non uh, non uh, discussed question: What is Marxist criticism, and how does Marxist criticism influence the formation, or which uh, constructive elements what were taken uh, for the formation of socialist approach afterwards? Yeah, but for sure, in 1919, 1918, and 1920, we didn't know, uh, or we can't talk about like a real Marxist critique because we don't know what is real Marxist critique was there. Uh, and um, uh, the question to, to Oleg, uh, I wanted to pose is, actually, I really liked your idea to place uh, <laughs> innovative idea, futurist approach, um, uh, and uh, to highlight this uh, social nature of uh, uh, Ukrainian literary criticism and uh, uh, reflection uh, on it. Um, so the question is, uh, what you were um, presenting actually uh, goes within the framework of the uh, special um, nature of Ukrainian formalism, which um, is never pure formalism as uh, Russian formalism, for example, yeah, and which tried from the beginning to synthesize like social and formal, like social formal approach. And in this case, I think all the debates on the art uh, that we know from uh, futurists, yeah, uh, they are in this wider framework of, um, of the um, development of Ukraine literary criticism from the beginner, beginning. And also right now we're thinking about that this precise nature uh, of the uh, both artistic and theoretical practices was given by the previous um, um, literary development, uh, by the previous functions fulfilled by literature. Yeah? So literature was seen as something that has to teach and to form. So literature, Ukrainian literature, and partly actually Polish literature, they uh, filled this precise aim uh, to educate and to form the nation. So actually it is a kind of social uh, mission from the beginning. So it uh, probably um, partly explain why uh, the phenomenon we are talking about, they are not pure formal, not pure social, yeah? They are, they, they are trying to combine it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah. Yes, so, yeah, this is a pretty complicated uh, uh, question. Um, we know that when uh, that Semenko came out of the modernist movement, right? And the modernist movement 
uh, was uh, against tendentiousness in literature. Uh, so th the initial orientation was certainly formalist uh, uh, to create something new in literature. Um, I think also because this was a futurist uh, uh, movement, much like the Italian, right? It was also very ideologically uh, uh, committed. Uh, so the, the, the concept of a new culture, of a new nation, uh, of, of a technologically advanced nation of speed, and all these elements that are part of uh, a sort of the futurist ideology, I think formed uh, also Ukrainian futurism. And for them, it was important. So uh, the thematic element, let's put it this way, in futurist uh, uh, writing is very important. And they would pick on uh, out very modern themes. Uh, so they were not, uh, they did not ignore um, a theme. They did not ignore subject matter. For them, this was very, very, very important, even though that the subject matter had to be in a new form. Uh, I think the other element is that, um, you know, unlike, for example, the proletarian critics, like in, in organizations like Hart or Plug, uh, which took their cue often from the party and which took their cue from uh, really traditional realism. Mm -hmm. uh, the futurists were completely oriented on the here and now uh, and on formal experimentation. So th this is what I mean about the uh, social aspect. Uh, and a lot of this um, ideology that they reflected that they, and the way they wrote, I think this is the most important thing, the, most, the way they wrote about uh, a life at that time was very personal, very subjective. They did not take their cue from the party. So I think one of the criticisms that um, was leveled against futurism, especially by Ukrainian emigre critics, was that they were too communist, that they were too Soviet. But I think what most critics uh, have failed to notice is that this was a very individualistic, very personal take on socialism, on communism, uh, and for this very reason, the Communist Party did not like them because they were espousing something uh, very subjective and personal and they didn't follow in the footsteps of the party. So this, the social aspect shouldn't probably be confused with the official uh, social policies and ideologies uh, that were slowly, especially after let's say 1925, 1927, dominating society. Until probably 1927, there was a, a free for all uh, in Ukrainian society. And the futurists were able to um, speak with one of the louder voices uh, at that time. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, of course. Good. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I tried to get a question. So, um, uh, about your remark, um, I can say that uh, Koryak was convinced that he is a real Marxist critique. Um, at the same time, he don't, uh, he didn't like classical scientists. Uh, classical academy. And in this sense, of course, he was typical Soviet Marxist critic and um, Soviet scientist. Uh, but uh, Koryak uh, was, uh, I, must, I must say, it, uh, clever, clever critic. So he uh, felt and he understood that uh, his interpretation of literature uh, was limited uh, by, uh, by class um, ideological, by class uh, ideology. So um, 
today we can use um, we can use um, deconstruction as a very good method to understand um, choreographic discourse or uh, discourse of uh, early Soviet uh, literary movement. Thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, Andrei, uh, you're next, please. Yep. I, I'm going to the source, so I'm going to have a question for Alek Hlinitsky. Uh, if we try to apply to Ukrainian futurism, I mean, not Ukrainian futurism, Ukrainian formalism, the same framework that was used in Kristina Pomorska's uh, book uh, about Russian formalism and its poetic ambience. Uh, I wanted to ask you whether the, there is a relevance of Ukrainian futurism to the development of formalism in Ukraine. Because um, in the way that I see it um, is that there was definitely a poetic ambience. But um, I think for those who created Ukrainian formalism, the inspiration came not from the avant-garde dimension, but more from the uh, neoclassicists. Uh, Mikola Zarev, Pavlo Filipovich, and especially Boris Yakubsky, a nickname by Zarev Aristarch, uh, who was the literary theoretician and who published, um, I believe it's probably the first book of, of Ukrainian formalism, Nauka Gershuania. So I wanted mm -hmm. to find uh, your opinion uh, on this, and I understand that then Ukrainian formalism, uh, Ukrainian futurists uh, interact with formalism later in the time of Nova Nova Generatsia, and especially Alexei Poltaraski, who writes this uh, big critique of Shklovsky, but I think it was more related to Shklovsky as a persona than the formalism as the method. Uh, yes, it's um, it's a tricky. Uh, <laughs> situation, uh, the, the futurists um, tended to, you know, go their own way. They obviously were very much aware of what was going on around them. Uh, they knew what was going on uh, with the Russian formalists, the school per se. They knew uh, Russian futurism, uh, but they were always adamant that they were not just, you know, some copy of uh, either one or the other. Uh, and because they were a avant-garde movement, I think they took their inspiration very often from uh, Western avant-garde, uh, mm -hmm. Italian futurism, particularly German expressionism and Dada. Uh, and when they were, they, they had to have a theory, let's put it this way, because it was important to theorize because you had the Marxists, uh, you had them maybe the neoclassicists who were more traditional and, and the futurists felt that they had to uh, present their own program within this competitive environment. And so uh, they came up with this idea of uh, pan-futurism this was their, the name of their official uh, formalist theory. And what they argued is that the, uh, from the moment of uh, Italian futurism and the avant-garde that followed, that this was all one phenomenon. So pan-futurism was in a sense, a kind of pan-avant-gardism. And what they, thought they were doing original, it was that they were not interested in sort of the private uh, pursuit of their own little movement. Uh, they wanted to speak about art broadly as a phenomenon and what was happening to it at this time and what would happen to it in the future. So that it is true that when you look through their writings, 
there are all, all kinds of elements, the Dadaistic elements, the expressionistic elements, uh, there are formalist uh, elements, but they managed to weave this into, I think, something pretty uh, unique uh, for them. You know, I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with the work of uh, Peter Berger, the, the theory of the avant-garde. Uh, I think I personally I think it's one of the best books on on, on the avant-garde. And what struck me when I read uh, uh, Berger's book uh, that um, it uh, it echoes uh, some of the things that the Ukrainian futures were already uh, speaking about. And when I spoke about Skripnik uh, today. Um, uh, I wanted to sort of imply that there was a kind of, uh, you know, dialogue between Simon Kohl and the Ukrainian futurists and Peter Berger in the 1970s. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, he, he didn't know anything about Ukrainian futurism. But what, what this tells me is that some of the concerns of uh, leftist and Marxist critics like Berger uh, were already present in the discussions of the Ukrainian futurists, uh, namely uh, art for art's sakes, uh, the autonomy of art. And certainly the, the social pressure uh, of the 1920s was such that um, you had to address these issues because you were being criticized uh, for them especially by the proletarian critics, the Marxist critics. So I think the, the pan-futurist theory in a sense was a response to the uh, you know, current situation in, in Ukrainian culture. And it sort of prefigures some of the concerns that we will see in Marxist criticism voiced uh, you know, decades after this as well. Thank you. All right, uh, Natalia Vusatyuk, uh, proszę. Uh, I have, I would like to ask Olesia a very simple question, maybe not simple. Uh, did uh, Vladimir Koryak's archive survive? Uh, where is his archive? And uh, I have one more comment on our discussion. To my mind, to my mind, in uh, the 1920s, 1930s, there was a competition in Ukrainian, lit in Ukrainian criticism uh, between um, sociologists uh, or uh, adherents of uh, Marxist methods. And they were all creating new, new Marxist methods, but nobody knew uh, what uh, was this Marxist method. Uh, there was a discussion between uh, termino uh, terminological discussion uh, is Marxist method the same as sociological method, or are they different? And for example, Brice Kupti had uh, answered that they are synonyms. Uh, there were another, uh, Pavlov Petrenko had another answer. And so on. Um, so we have not only um, uh, uh, this pluralism of, uh, of formalist trends in the Ukrainian criticism of the 1920s, but also the pluralism of different kinds of sociological Marxist methods. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry because I had some problem with my earphones and I, I, I heard you not very well, so excuse me. Uh, I, I, and 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 echo in my earphones, and I'm I'm so sorry. So it's hard to to hear me. And <laughs> so um, about uh, about competition between different uh, scholars, Marxist scholars. Um, of course, it's very even it's very new question. Uh, did exist different Marxist. Uh, scholars or Marxist uh, schools in early Ukrainian literary movement. Uh, I, do I right understand your question? Uh, I mean, uh, there were many, uh, uh, many uh, Marxist, many theorists with uh, their concepts of sociological or Marxist methods. 
It was my, uh, just a comment. And my question was about uh, Korak's archive. Where is his archive? And uh, what uh, which um, materials from this archive survived today? Okay. I must confess, I am not specialist in Korak. <laughs> Uh, heritage. Uh, I'm not biographer, biographer of Koryak, but um, uh, preparing these topics, um, uh, I uh, studied uh, only his articles, his books, and uh, his criminal case. Um, about his archives, um, his uh, private library was lost. Uh, I think maybe some some books uh, we, we can we will we will find. Um, um, uh, but about him, uh, private archive, I I can't I can't uh, I can't tell about. Um, Annette, uh, please, you can go next, and then Helen, I see again. Okay, if there's still time, I would, uh, I would like to, to, to give questions to everybody. Thank you very much, all of you, uh, for your uh, talk. Um, but I'm in a project also on futurism at the Free University, and um, one thesis I always had on Ukrainian futurism, I'm not an expert on it, much more on Italian, on Russian, on Jewish futurism, but I, I started to learn it maybe five or eight years ago. I have a question on Oleg, is that I always teach that um, Ukrainian futurism is the most cosmopolitan internet, uh, um, futurism, you could say, because they published a lot of things in different languages. And I wanted to ask, is, is this a right, um, is this right in your opinion that um, if you regard only language, um, Ukrainian futurism has always a lot of um, publications in different languages. And the second question would be a, a little bit more in general. Um, we all are regarding futurism, formalism, especially futurism, always through text. But uh, futurism, in my opinion, learned a lot about um, um, is very important also as a kind of practice of literature. It's a kind of um, doing small performances, doing a lot of rupture, um, shocking, and so on. And this is also, this begins with the Italian futurism, the Serate Futuristiche, as they called it. And it's always visible also in, 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 um, in German expressionism, who is not so very, very much an avant-garde, I think, expressionism. It's a little bit different. And also in Russian futurism and always in, uh, also some Jewish um, authors. And I would be interested, there are only uh, small books, but would it be interesting to look in Ukrainian futurism? Can, would, would we find a lot of about uh, this kind of practices they had? Like, um, yeah disturbing the public, um, making speeches like, um, or disturbing like, um, like the, the anarchists, for example. I think there's a missing link between the anarchism and, and uh, futurism. Um, I think they learned a lot about um, uh, to disturb the public through avant-garde, uh, through anarchism reception. And uh, you're a big expert on it. And I wanted to ask you these two very general questions on futurism. I apologize for the question, but I'm very interested in it because I know there's also a big a very big movement on Ukrainian anarchism. And so I'm interested in this uh, theme, the linkage between practice, literary practice and literary theory, you could say. Thank you very much for that question. Um, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, first of all, about the cosmopolitanism. Uh, yes, uh, they, they certainly were very cosmopolitan. They were very... 
open to um, you know other movements, and uh, you can see this um, uh, in in their publications. Um, they 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 published uh, uh, about uh, you know uh, France about Germany. Uh, they, some of their texts uh, appeared in English. Um, they tried to use uh, uh, summaries of articles in Esperanto or in German or in French. Uh, and so they were very open to uh, uh, what was happening in Europe. Um, uh, so that, that's, that's a cosmopolitan uh, uh, aspect uh, of Ukrainian futurism. Um, sometimes uh, people accuse them of being you know, eclectic. Uh, and that sometimes has a negative connotation, but I but I would say that in the case of Ukrainian futurism, this was a, a positive feature. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, performance is concerned, uh, yes, by all means, as um, many as the Italians, in particular, of course, as we know, uh, that the Ukrainians were very much interested in shocking the public. Uh, uh, you, uh, Simon Koshak, the Ukrainian audiences by, you know, uh, dumping uh, Taras Shevchenko and criticizing him. For Ukrainians, that was absolutely uh, terrible. And he, they never forgave him for, for that uh, uh, act. The future is also, again, uh, because of the pressure under which they were uh, in Ukrainian society, uh, because they were accused of formalism, of being uh, Ivy Tower, tower uh, poets and writers. Uh, for uh, about two years, they tried to go into the masses, as they would say. Uh, they would have uh, uh, public lectures about futurism. Uh, they would read poetry uh, to workers in factories and things like that. Uh, so there is definitely evidence of this. Um, unfortunately, we don't have as much evidence as, for example, there is for, for Italian uh, futurism. But the idea of performing uh, their, their work, their poetry in particular, uh, that's, that's clearly, uh, clearly was there. And we can see that even in the style of writing. Uh, the style of writing of uh, much of this poetry is very rhetorical. And you could see it was uh, meant to be uh, performed not only uh, uh, read. Um, as, as, as to anarchism, yes. Uh, for example, they were great fans of Dada. And I think uh, this, this, this is an aspect of uh, the anarchist movement. And there, there were moments where Ukrainian futures were even accused of uh, being uh, anarchistic. Um, they, they liked to shock. Uh, and uh, shock was one of the, I think, social elements of the movement. Uh, you shock the audience, you shock your reader in order to change them, to transform society, uh, move it in a different direction. Thank uh, you very much. Okay, we have about four minutes left by my clock. We maybe can go a couple of minutes over time. Alina, uh, you have a question uh, for a second time. You have your hand still raised. Uh, yes, I have a question to Olena Huleta, if I may. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, because we're a little bit over missed your just wonderful presentation. I just wanted to highlight uh, it once more that the diary of Mezhenka, Olena was talking about, he is still not published. And I think it's our like mission or task number one. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's very, uh, yeah, it's very important document. Unfortunately, I didn't work with that. So um, I learned a lot from what you were saying. So my brief question is, because I have a lot, but I decided to, to, to make one close to our discussion um, about this, his article, Nashlechak de Novoi Literaturnoi Tori. It seems to me if we are talking about Ukrainian formalism, and uh, uh, I really liked that you highlight this uh, precise um, border between 1917-1921-22 and what was going mm -hmm. after. Yeah, so this diary shows it very good. So the question is, uh, it seems, I know this article very good, uh, and it seems to me that Mezhenko, he is um, uh, 
adore the form and then he is uh, trying to um to suggest a formalist um, approach and analysis he uh, he built uh, his uh, like uh, a line from Patidnya, uh, Bieli and Jermunski. yeah and uh, if we will uh, read this article quite attentively we will see that indeed uh, he is not the pure formalist in what he is saying <laughs> he is just uh, um, a kind of trying to suggest but still the basement for his uh, thoughts here yeah, is <laughs> Uh, like this uh, uh, um, social uh, function, yeah, it, mm -hmm. it is there. So that's why he chooses to appeal to Zermunski and not to Shklovsky, to Eichenbaum and others. So I just wanted to hear what you think about this. Okay, I will try to be very short but and answer quickly. First of all, publication um, of this diary. I have to say that I was surprised that when I found this one uh, in Mejanko archive because I didn't expect, as I said, I know that uh, according to Mejanko, it was just destroyed, lost, something like that, and nothing functioned in a sphere of literary criticism. Why well, it's not so easy and uh, um, so it's not possible to so quickly to prepare it for public because, as I said, it also contained a lot of private information, different names, and sometimes I <laughs> really spent a lot of time just to read these names and to discover what uh, who are the people who are uh, mentioned in this diary. It's not so easy, but yes, I think that it could be a very interesting publication and benefit Ukrainian literary studies, maybe not on the Ukrainian literary studies. And now about his public his article, yeah. Uh, as for me, it's it's especially interesting to compare this one article and his diary because in diary he described different kind of problem he faced it in this theoretical field. But you are really right. I just was thinking um, during our discussion, um, I was focusing on a question that Russian formalists who were influenced by futurist practices, literary practices, um, mostly dedicate their work to classical literary, uh, Russian literature, yes, to 19th century uh, novels, poetry, and so on, so on. And even if they dedicate um, their research to 20th century uh, works, mostly to modernist writers, but not so often to futurist writers, yes. In Ukrainian um, case, situation was a bit different, especially in case of Majenko. As for him, the starting point of his interest in formalistic theory was a question how to create a new kind of art, not how to analyze our pre previous tradition. And that is also um, connected with the general situation, because according to Mashanka, we do not have so stretched uh, strength, uh, strength tradition that we need to opposite our tradition. Yes, we need to like deconstruct. No, we just have to construct, but construct not a liturgy of the 19th century, yes, or 18th century, but we have to uh, image something completely new, and for him, it was also a change for Ukrainian culture. After all, I just would like to underline another one thing, that if he stressed that his Ukrainian uh, intelligent, yes, that is not because he would like to differentiate himself, that is because as he wrote, uh, it is not possible to avoid this differentiation. Even if he start to describe his relation with women, he said that why it is not possible for me just to be a simple man, I always define it as Ukrainian, yeah, even in this private context. That's a very interesting question, yes, because it's a kind of uh, defining somebody as an other in this Soviet culture, just because he is speaking not Russian language, but in uh, Ukrainian language, even in some private situation. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for your remarks. And I think we find some new topics also for discussion yes, and for further studies. Thank you so much, Olena. Andri, and that would be our final question for today. Well, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. I, I just have one uh, remark about what Annette said um, uh, about cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism or Ukrainian futurism. I think it's very significant that uh, when 
Семенко Publishers Futurism в українській поезії в Інде Колекшн Семафору Майбутні. He uses uh, Latin uh, letters. The manifesto is written in, in Ukrainian, but he uses Latin letters and, and uh, um, kind of a breakthrough because for me it's significant and up to this point because when we published the Russian translation of this manifesto, I had to fight with the publisher that we will have uh, the original in Latin alphabet you know, in Ukraine, but in Latin alphabet, um, reproduced there so that it will be very um, visible how, how it was done. Because Ukrainian formalists, or futurists, as opposed to Russian futurists in 1920s, they are linked to Europe when Russian futurism becomes the tool for the Bolsheviks, you see? And it doesn't happen in Ukraine. Uh, the Russian immigration denounces futurism as the Bolshevik art. However, Ukrainian immigration, I think, in a sense, supports it. That's why they opened the, the publishing in, in Berlin, the Goldstrom Publishing, right, in 1923, where they published uh, Yuri Shpol. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I do not remember, but there were other publications related to futurism. So that was my remark. And uh, the question that I had for Elena is about uh, other, are there any other volumes of Mizhenko Diaries or it's the only one that survives? Uh, maybe there is something that, that is uh, preserved at the uh, Publicna Biblioteca where he worked before, before the war and during blockade. Thank you. Yeah, so I can respond now. So I don't need to, to raise my hand. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, this one diary is not the only one. Uh, another one, so uh, another one is written during the Second World War uh, in time that Mazhenko uh, had been in Leningrad. He spent all this time, yes, in Leningrad. And this diary is also written in Ukrainian language. And he described this, um, uh, the library, this professional um, community. Uh, and also in uh, um, 1943, 1944, 45, he also um, include into this diary some, um, uh, some, some remarks about, about Ukraine. And he articulate his idea and his dream to return to Ukraine to rebuild National Library of Ukraine. And this diary is for me is especially interesting just for my research, yes, also because it's a kind of construction about his memory about 20s from the perspective of the middle 40s. And then it's also interesting to compare his this image of Ukrainian culture of 20s because it was a really hard time for, Maz for Mazhenko. In 23, he was fired from his position in National Library, then from the book chamber and so on, so on. And at the same time, he even wrote that he understand that he has some kind of imaginal and even idealistic image of this one period, but nevertheless, he differentiate between Ukrainian culture and other national cultures. So for me, it's interesting to understand how this cultural belonging is constructing, changing, and so on. So, but yes, I agree. It would be also very important to publish this one part of his diary. But the problem is that in time that Mezhenko was involved very deeply in active life, he just stopped to write his diary because he had not enough of time. And what I would like to add to our discussion about Ukrainian futurism and different languages of Ukrainian futurism, that is that literary creativity was very closely connected with art, with uh, film production also. And Semenko himself had been for several years uh, chief in editor uh, of Odessa uh, um, Odessa Film Factory, Vufko, yes, all Ukrainian photo cinema administration. But that's another topic, another question, an issue for discussion, I think. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, dear colleagues. I'm so glad that we had this rich and illuminating and multifaceted discussion of this important topic that uh, 
has certainly uh, gave us a much deeper insight now in the fascinating and um, complex um, multidimensional world of Ukrainian uh, literary uh, scholarship and its broader social contexts in uh, the 1920s. We are unfortunately out of our time, so please join me in thanking our panelists uh, for their presentation and big thanks to you uh, in the audience. And to be continued, we still have two more days of uh, wonderful presentations, so please uh, stay with us and rejoin uh, tomorrow and then on Saturday. So, uh, uh, Andrei, Helena, do we need to make any closing remarks for today, or are we all good? If we're all good, Dobro uh, Vechera Usim uh, v Evropi, uh, Dobroho Dnia 